the Herald Sun, commemorating this memorable milestone with its Dean Smith Special Souvenir Edition and poster. Warner Books, publishers of the Dean's List, and by Subway, the way a sandwich should be. And now, Mick Mixon and Woody Durham. Welcome back live to the Joel Coliseum in Winston-Salem, where history has been made. The Tar Heels beat Colorado for win number 877. The game is over. The game is over, and Zwicker runs to get the ball from Brownstein. The Tar Heels wanted the basketball. Dean Smith is down to shake hands with Ricardo Pat. Bill Guthridge is now shaking hands along with Phil Ford, and now the players are coming over to Coach Smith. Antoine James. One thanks the University of North Carolina. Uh, to a coach there at a great academic institution uh, where it's easy to, to recruit to a college town like that and to have the support of the administration even back when I was uh, hung in F Street at one time uh, they were the chancellor and uh, as everybody was still for me the, those that mattered Woody as a mathematician and a, as a statistician Dean Smith understands better than anyone the value of numbers he's relied on statistics to really define the, the philosophy by which he coaches the game of basketball. But it's kind of ironic that he seemed a little bit uncomfortable with the record keeping that, that led up to 877. It? <laughs> That's right, Mick. It started on a December night in 1961. His first team, the 1961-62 Tar Heels, beat Virginia. And if you think he can't call things off the top of his mind earlier this week and talking about that game, right off the top of his head he remembered the final score of 80 to 46. it's already been an emotional day here in winston-salem and if you stay with us for the next emotional hour we promise you you will not be disappointed up next 877 a tribute to college basketball's all-time winningest coach you know you work hard 877, presented by Furniture Land South, continues. On February 28, 1931, in Emporia, Kansas, a son was born to two public school teachers, Alfred and Vesta Smith. In an appropriate and ironic twist of fate, they named him Dean, a word that means the head of a division of a college. The young Dean Edward Smith was an outstanding athlete, but it was his intellect that set him apart. He turned down an academic scholarship to Columbia University and accepted a similar offer at Kansas where he played varsity basketball, baseball, and freshman football. As a reserve guard on Jayhawk squads that won the national championship in 1952 and finished second in 53, Dean Smith absorbed everything he could from his legendary coach, Dr. Forrest Fogg Allen. A math major, Dean Smith thought briefly about medical school but instead became an assistant coach at Kansas under Dr. Allen. After a brief stint in the Air Force, he served as an assistant to Bob Spear at the Air Force Academy. Then in 1958, Carolina basketball coach Frank McGuire hired him to join the Tar Heel staff. In the summer of 1961, Coach McGuire left Chapel Hill for the NBA's Philadelphia Warriors, and University Chancellor Bill Aycock wasted no time in promoting McGuire's 30-year-old top assistant. As chancellor, I got to know him and uh, formed a very high regard for him as a person, uh, quite apart from his obvious ability to coach. My memory is in, uh, for about 48, in about 48 hours, uh, Coach Smith was selected as the head coach uh, because I was confident that he was the uh, appropriate person to uh, succeed Coach McGuire. We found out about the the change during the summer when most of us were at camp. Letterman Mike Cook remembers the transition between the flashy McGuire and the hyper-organized Smith. So we called each other, I don't know, I was rooming with Larry Brown. We called, what are you going to do, what do you think? Uh, you know, we were all concerned because it was a bad cop, good cop situation before that. I mean, McGuire was the good old guy who would pat us on the back and tell us how great we were, and then Coach Smith would run the practices and, uh, you know, run the heck out of us, and he was tough. So we were apprehensive, I guess you, you could say. We were just concerned that he was going to run the heck out of us, which he did. And McGuire was, you know, he was like uh, the hero. He was everybody's god down there. One of the first things to change was Carolina's style of play. Teammate Charlie Schaffer explained. I never will forget early in that first year, Coach Smith let everybody know that we were going to play man-to-man -man defense. 
and that was going to kind of be the centerpiece of our program. And it was a change for a lot of people uh, because before Carolina had been playing a lot of zone defense. To emphasize man-to-man -man defense and to focus on passing the ball, working the ball, and the teamwork, and so forth. Uh, it was just great to be there when that system was first put in place. Dean Smith was ready for his first game as head coach against Virginia and Chapel Hill on December 2nd. Again, Mike Cook. We started um, Donnie Walsh and Larry Brown and, and Jim Hudock, who was our captain at center, and then Brian McSweeney and Dita Krause. He was a little nervous. He was, if you remember, only a few years older than we were. So we were kind of all in this thing together. Gave us a little pep talk, very calm pep talk, and we all went out and, uh, you know, we really ran Virginia right off the floor, actually. 80-46 was the final score, and in true Dean Smith style, every detail was thought through, except for one small thing. And I remember Dean saying that he had everything prepared, but he forgot the game ball. And Elliot Murnick, had, manager, had to run around and find a game ball, but once that he got squared away, we were ready for the game. Smith also forgot that he had installed a new tired signal, a clenched fist raised towards the bench. Larry Brown used it, only to have Coach Smith shake his fist right back at him with a hearty, way to go, Larry. That first team finished 8-9. and nine. It would be his only losing season. Career coaching win number 12 stands out. It was against Adolph Rupp's powerful Kentucky Wildcats in Lexington on December 17th. He took on the master at that point in time, and Carolina won. We beat Kentucky in Lexington, and Coach Smith coached a fabulous basketball game. I, I can't imagine anybody coaching a better game than he did in December of 1962. Kentucky leads by one, 12.30 to play. We knew then uh, that he was a fabulous coach. And with that, Kentucky calls for timeout. Rupp is hot as a match. We played a great game because Coach Smith mapped it out perfectly. We knew exactly what we were supposed to do, and we carried it out the way he wanted us to. Charlie Sheffer and his Tar Heel teammates had pulled off the first of many Dean Smith upset victories. The win was sweet, but the rebuilding job was far from done. There were the lingering effects of NCAA probation from the McGuire years, and recruiting against Vic Bubas of Duke and Everett Case at NC State was difficult. Larry Brown was in the class of 63, and now, from the perspective of a successful coach himself, says that there was a hidden blessing in those struggles. For the first four or five years, it was not easy, and he kept plugging and building. But people were disenchanted with Coach. Um, they really didn't understand why we weren't winning. They didn't really realize the limitations that he was faced with. And uh, it was a factor. It was sad being around him, but he never gave up. Uh, he never complained. I think it was a challenge for him. It made him stronger, and I think it made him... A, or even a better person than he was at that time. Despite being hung in effigy in January of 1965 after a 22-point loss at Wake Forest, Coach Smith's job was secure with Chancellor Acock. He wasn't uh, put on any win-loss win schedule that had anything to do with uh, whether or not he would be here because uh, we were all aware that there'd been limitations uh, put on the program uh, prior to him becoming head coach. And the important thing was that, uh, that he secured all the backing that he was entitled to uh, while uh, we worked out of those limitations and uh, at the time would eventually come when he would uh, uh, have an opportunity to prove precisely what he could do. The late 60s marked Carolina's resurgence as a national power under Dean Smith. The players and the philosophy next. Visit Furniture Land South in High Point for the ultimate home furnishing shop. Today in Winston-Salem, 73-56. You're listening to 877, a tribute to college basketball's all-time winningest coach. And we pause 10 seconds now for station identification on the Tar Heel Sports Network. 877, presented by Furniture Land South, continues. Dean Smith's former players each describe him in their own way, of course. But a few of the same words repeat, like consistency. This recording, made more than 30 years ago, dates itself only by the youthful sound in Coach Smith's voice. I think overall I believe in the good shot. Defensively, I believe in a man-to-man, -man, although from time to time we will play a zone. But And I believe in changing defenses and changing offenses uh, to change the tempo for another team. Some nights we'll run, some nights we'll walk, but... Uh, most of the time, we always look for the fast break. Mainly, our philosophy is uh, certainly to 
uh, fit the system to the ball players. We do not have a system and then recruit ball players to that system. We prefer to find outstanding student athletes who can play basketball and then adjust the system to them. Yet don't think for a minute that Coach Smith clings stubbornly to out of style basketball beliefs. He's constantly thinking, experimenting, and innovating. Brad Doherty, class of 1986. I think that's how you get the most out of people and the most out of young individuals, by being able to be flexible enough to understand, but yet to, uh, to have a good uh, fundamental philosophy that you're going to work from no matter what the situation is. And uh, I've always admired that about him. I think that's why he has been able to stick around and to participate at such a high level, uh, similar to what Joe Paterno, I think of those two guys on the same type of uh, mindset. Another former center, Mitch Kupchak, general manager of the Los Angeles Lakers. Players, you know, don't have to pass the ball eight to ten times to get a good shot. Now you have a three-point line, and more often than not, if you get a good look at the three-point line, whether you're 6'3 or 6'10", you know, he would encourage you to take that. And I don't think those are things he did. Well, I know they're not things he did 25 years ago. So he's continued to change with the rules, and I think a lot of coaches, you know, don't have that ability. Um, and if the rules change next year or the year after that, you know, my best guess is he'll be at the front, you know, leading the charge uh, about how to take advantage of those rules. Sometimes, instead of changing with the rules, the rules change according to Coach Smith. Matt Doherty remembers how Carolina held the ball against Ralph Sampson's Virginia Club in the 1982 ACC Tournament Final. Well, our game plan was to, you know, spread the court, make them come out and play us man-to-man. -man. When they didn't, uh, that was fine with us because we had the lead in the ball. So, you know, we'd, we'd uh, go and finish the game 6 nothing if that was the score. We were the ACC champs. We played within the rules. We felt it was Virginia's uh, decision to make it a slowed-down game or make it an up-tempo game. We could play either way. The Heels won it 47-45, to 45, and soon college basketball adopted the shot clock and the three-point field goal. Other Dean Smith innovations include the famous four corners attack, the free-throw line huddle, and a method of wholesale substitution of which Bruce Buckley, class of 1977, was frequently a part. The blue team is what you, uh, or who your friends are, because you get beat up on practice by the white team all the time. It, it's forged during the practices. And when the blue team has a big guy and a point guard and some defensive hustlers, it, 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 it's a great concept and it works. Dean Smith players also learn that excellence is achieved only through the tedium and repetition of practice. Pat Sullivan says that learning how to practice builds time management skills that remain long after athletic talent has eroded. Well, a Carolina practice is certainly one that's very, very organized, one that you better expect to uh, come to work hard, extremely hard. And like I said, I mean, there's no time to rest. When you end one drill, Coach Smith, does, you know, there's no time to walk over and get some water and hang around and joke and laugh. You're, all, you're on to the next drill. And that's, that's the – but it, it is great, though, because – Maybe as a freshman and sophomore, you don't understand, but as you get older, you see, wow, when you work real hard and you move on after drill after drill after drill, it becomes habit, and that's, that's what makes Carolina team so good. Larry Miller, class of 1968, on discipline, the Dean Smith way. If we stepped out of line, I uh, remember when he threw me out of practice in my junior year for about a week because I violated some team rules, but that was, that was probably the loneliest feeling of my life, is being, you know, when, once you become part of a team, an integral part of a team, and then you're not allowed to be part of that team. And over the years, you've seen what happened when some people were late for meetings or team buses or something like that, that they paid the price. And it's not a democracy at Carolina. Jersey City, New Jersey's outspoken Michael Corrin found that out the hard way after a loss at Duke where the Heels played a waiting game. After the game, the, the, the reporters crowded around me, why'd you hold the ball? And, and, and I said something that North Carolina players probably don't say, but uh, I said back then, well, I, I wanted to play with them. I felt we can play with them. He wanted to hold the ball, pointing to Coach Smith, and, and uh, I remember him calling me in his office after that and say, listen, I'll, I'll do the coach and you do the plan, and put the weighted vest on, and why don't you go run a few stairs. Can you imagine George Lynch, class of 1993, being intimidated by anything? He was during his first meeting with Coach Smith. I went in his office. He was sitting behind his big desk, and... Uh, yeah, you see pictures of James, uh, former players on the wall, and it, it was very intimidating. I think now the relationship uh, that Coach Smith and I have is is more of a uh, player friendship type relationship. I think the first time I met him, I was more intimidated and couldn't really talk to him. Now that you know we've 
spent so much time on the, over the phone over the past years. It's easier for me to hold a conversation with him. <laughs> Eventually, the intimidation becomes affection. Walter Davis, class of 1977. Everyone knows what a great basketball coach he is, but so what's a, a great, wonderful person. And when you're around someone like that, you want to try to win every game for them because you have that special feeling for them. Bobby Jones also recalls not wanting to disappoint Coach Smith. He had played well, but in a losing effort against Wake Forest. As we walked off, you know, I was heading to the locker room, and Coach Smith, I knew, was going to go in there, and then he had to face the press and all the other things. And really, our season was basically over as far as NCAA was concerned. And he stopped me in the hallway, and, and he had never done that before. And he just said to me, he said, Bobby, I just want to tell you I appreciated the way that you, you gave the effort tonight. And he said, I just want to tell you that. And, you know, that really stuck out in my mind. I, it really made an impact in my life that, that he was concerned enough about my mental well-being to, to stop and, and to spend some time with me and to say that to me, even though, you know, his whole world was crushing in on him, too. And Dean Smith stands by his players and his principals. At an early age, he decided that racial prejudice and segregation were wrong. At one time, not all Chapel Hill restaurants were open to all people. I did not know him until he showed up at Dinkley Church in the early days of the congregation. This was in the late 50s. Nobody knew Dean Smith. He and his family had just arrived in Chapel Hill. Coach Smith's pastor and friend, Dr. Robert Siebel. Dean went with me uh, to ensure that the Pines restaurant was open to all people. At that time, the basketball team, of course, was all white, and they had had many of their meals at the Pines. And the Pines was one of the segregated restaurants, one of the last holdouts in Chapel Hill. And when the public accommodations law was passed, um, members of Binkley Church paired up and went to these establishments to be served a meal to make sure that they were ready to comply with the law. And I remember very vividly going with Dean to the Pines restaurant with a black student to see if we would be seated for, for dinner. There was some hesitation, but the door opened and we were welcomed, and that was the beginning of an integrated Pines restaurant. In 1966, Coach Smith beat out Davidson's Lefty Drizel for a New York native and Carolina's first scholarship black athlete, Charlie Scott. I came here as a 17-year-old uh, a, a guy out of Harlem, you know, really very frightening. And, and, and I have to give a lot of credit to really the atmosphere, the people of my surroundings, the people that made me feel comfortable, the people that allowed me to be myself and, and, and to really feel like a part of, of, of Carolina. You know, uh, coming here was just as all, like I told my, my freshman class, uh, some of them said they were in awe of me. I was in awe of the whole circumstance. And, and, and you really... You, you go through it without really consciously knowing what you're doing. Then when you look back on it, I mean, then I can feel a, a, a bit of pride on saying that I knew that I did the best that I could do it. Former players like Al Wood, Eric Montross, and Dave Popson are typical of those who came to Carolina to learn about basketball and left knowing how to be men. One of the things that Coach Smith taught me more than anything was uh, how to be responsible. Uh, although I myself uh, went through a, a period of time where I didn't live up to that, but now... Uh, the thing he, he told me the most was uh, also if you make a mistake you get away from it you can always come back so I, I really appreciate that he wants us to have a lot of respect for other people and I think most of his players have done that so it's more to him than just coaching X's and O's on the basketball court but it's off the basketball court as well. It's a fantastic opportunity for players to come here and receive an education as well as uh, an education in the game of basketball. He's always stressing you know, the little quotes of the day before before each practice. You know, back when you were a player, you think it's corny, but you, know, you look back on it and say, you know, this, some of those things we, we rehearsed before practice, you know, was <laughs> meant for the big game, you know, the game of life. Next, a Carolina trademark, the comeback. Against Harrison, trying to go baseline up for the shot. It's good. 45-44 with 4.6 seconds remaining. Stay quickly in batting. Benjamin coming front court. Benjamin the bounce pass. The strong block by Carter. Game is over. The finish at Raleigh. Another in a long chapter of games. The Heels somehow managed to win. With a dramatic comeback victory. And this no amount of airtime could do justice to the dozens of improbable comebacks Dean Smith teams have authored. But a tribute to Coach Smith without a chapter on the Tar Heels' unique ability to turn losses into wins would somehow be unjust. Miracles don't just happen in Chapel Hill. 
they usually The last 15 minutes of his practices are still spent with end-the-game situations. Coach Smith always said that if you took care of all the little details, that the big-picture detail would come together. Reese going front court against Rodney Rogers. Drives, penetrates, shots up, short. They battle for the ball. Reese going to take another shot. It's good! It's good! Carolina wins! Carolina wins! Ryan Reese follows up his missed shot! Fox, baseline. Up for the shot, good! Off the glass! Oklahoma calls timeout, but the game is over. The game is over. Carolina has upset number one, Oklahoma. Tar Heel point Carolina guard, and now Dean Smith assistant, Phil Ford. He has the ability to stay calm and cool all the time, uh, no matter what the situation is during the game, a uh, very important time in the game. I remember my, uh, my junior year here, uh, we were playing the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and the whole game. You know, we just kept staying in there, staying close, and they kept bombing uh, those long shots, and we had hands in their face, and Coach Smith kept telling us, it's okay, we're okay, we're all right. Got it away to Carlisle, still in the backcourt. Carlisle, Jordan stole it! Here goes Jordan from the dunk! Holy cow! Coach Smith always changes. You know, whether it's in a timeout, you know, in a huddle, will change a, a defense, will change an offensive play. Jeff Denning. Class of 1990. I mean, how many times can you think of Carolina going into the locker room at halftime, down five, down ten, down fifteen, uh, coming back in the second half and just you know turning the game around and, and winning the basketball? Three to off the corner for oh. It's down and the game is stopped. The clock is stopped with one second remaining. Wake Forest throws the ball the length of the floor. Unbelievable. Oh. The entire comeback was unbelievable. Mother of all Carolina comebacks occurred on March 2nd, 1974. One minute to play, 84-78. It looks like Duke may be about ready to pull off a stunning upset here of the nation's fourth-ranked basketball team. The great thing about Coach Smith is that we'd be down five with a minute to go, and he'd go, okay, we're right where we want to be. Tommy Lagarde was a freshman on that team. Because we're going to score here, then we're going to... We're going to press, we're going to steal the ball, or you're going to foul this guy and he's going to miss, and then we're going to go into this. And it was just like clear cut that we would win. It was never any doubt that we were in a bad situation. Elson fouls him, that's his fifth. Darrell is fouled out of the ball game, and that will just about do it right there. Five down with a minute to go. We're where we want to be. I mean, who else would say that? It's 86 78 with 17 seconds left to play. Duke is leading by eight. Forward. Bobby Jones. Really, I was not a very good foul shooter in uh, college and in for most of my pro career, so I those I was fortunate to make those two free throws. Next free throw is up and good also. It is 86 to 80. He basically sat us down to listen, Bobby. After Bobby makes these two free throws, we'll go into such and such a defense. Uh, I want you to steal the inbounds pass, make a basket, and call timeout. Former Tar Heel center, Mitch Kupchak. So we looked at each other and, you know, kind of said to ourselves, well, he's telling us what to do. Let's go out and do it. Why should it make the inbound play? Bounce it in, recovered by Walter Davis, underneath the Kuster. Layup is good by Kuster. Far Heels get a timeout, stopping the clock with 13 seconds left to play in the ball game. So hold everything. We came to the baseline and sat down with Coach again, and, and he told us what to do next. People that were leaving have suddenly stopped in the exit. Fleischer will make the inbound play. He's running the baseline. Tried to bounce it in. It was knocked away off Armstrong. Carolina control. No time. He left off the clock. And so after the second time of him telling us what to do, us doing it and it working, at that point in time, it's kind of like, hey, just tell us what to do, and, and we're confident, you know, it's going to work out. Jones has got it. Put it up. It goes. Time out. Time out. Take it. It's 86 to 84. Carolina has stopped the clock with six seconds left to play. Four seconds left. Kramer shooting one and one. The crowd comes alive. Kramer's free throw is up. It's missed. Kyle has got the rebound. Carolina gets timeout with three seconds left to play in the game. 
Walter shot at the end just uh, really boosted us into the overtime. Kupchak will make the long front court pass. Gets it to Walter Davis. Two, one. Walter takes the shot. Unbelievable! I played in a lot of games, a thousand NBA games, and so many other games, and I've seen so many games, but I've, I've never seen one like that, and uh, it was just, I, I feel great to be a part of that, that game. After that particular game, I think any one of us would have followed him anywhere, no, no, no matter what it may have been, he would be able to have followed him there. It was absolutely the best game I've ever been involved in. The championships, next. Furniture Land South and High Point invites you to work one-on-one. -on -one. Land South and High Point takes a different approach. To... Here again is Mick Mixon. Asking Coach Smith to compare his teams is like asking a parent which child is loved the most. But we are a society fascinated with winners, and Dean Smith's Tar Heels have captured two NCAA tournament crowns. Tonight, the Tar Heels, the nation's number one ranked team, riding a 15-game winning streak. After six Final Four trips and two appearances in the title game, Carolina met Georgetown for the national championship on the night of March 29, 1982. The year before, at the Spectrum in Philadelphia, the Tar Heels were beaten by Isaiah Thomas and the Indiana Hoosiers in the title game. Getting so close in 81, but losing, was a motivator for the team and senior point guard Jimmy Black. And I think we wanted to win one in particular because Coach Smith had taken a lot of flack for losing once again in the championship game. Black calls out the offense. No delay here for the Tar Heels. They're running their number one offensive play. We all wanted to dedicate ourselves and, and come back and win a national championship. We had, you know, gotten tired of hearing about how the monkey was on Carolina's back and so forth, so we wanted to do something about it. Away to Worthy. Worthy on Floyd for the dunk. And Floyd draws the foul. It was Gastonia against Gastonia. We had a young team, really. We had five players, basically, who played a lot of men, and so I felt that uh, collectively we had to really bear down and get the job done. Matt Doherty at the free throw line. He's gotten into the role tonight as more the playmaker, the guy to give up the ball. He would be very good at relaxing you, like he did before we played Georgetown in the final game, by making it, you know, go out and just play loose. And he has a... a certain way of uh, letting you, forcing you to relax and, and make it like it's just another game. Jimmy Black, Buzz Peterson, and the rest of the Tar Heels had a team meeting the day before practice opened on October 15th. The agenda was as brief as it was ambitious, winning the national championship. And that meeting, believe it or not, entailed every one of our team members sitting down and dedicating ourselves to this particular season. And every man stood up and said this is what we want to do this is what we need to do and this is how we are going to do it it took place in uh, jimmy black and chris Bruss's room there in grandma towers and uh basically jimmy and chris talked about hey we want to get back there everybody's got to uh, do the role it was probably the most productive meeting that we could have had at that particular time the one thing i remember about that year though when we were at the uh, eastern regions of raleigh we were cutting the nets down, and James Worthy didn't want to cut them down. And then I can remember that deep voice saying, I'll cut them down in New Orleans. Black holding high, goes to Darty. Darty and the double team gives it back to Black with 20 seconds left to play. Goes back to Michael Jordan, jumper from out on the left. Good! Every time I watch it on film, I still get chills. You know, I'm more nervous watching it than going out there actually doing it. 13, 12, 11, Georgetown with one timeout. Fred Brown looking, go oh, away to Worthy! I'm happy for Coach, most of all. Now I won't read any articles that you all sports writers are writing, and it won't say that he always chokes at the big game. Okay? Thank you, Jimmy. I don't think I'm a better coach now because we won a national if we'd lost. I think I've been the same coach. This is the only year it would have bothered me in that we had the best basketball team, I thought. Your immediate reaction is that of uh, joy and jubilation and, and jumping up and down and hugging each other. Then when you settle down, you kind of reflect and say, geez, what have we just been through? Not only that game, but the whole season. <laughs> What the hell do it, baby? We're going to take it home tonight. <laughs> National champion. Woo! Now, Winter Saints. The Marching Dead.
11 years later, also in the New Orleans Superdome, Carolina met Michigan. Like their predecessors in 82, George Lynch and the Tar Heels took metal possession of the championship with their preseason goal set. When the Saints go my The group of guys that we play with, um, Eric Montrose, Brian Reese, Derek Phelps, uh, Matt Weston, Salvador, and, and the rest of the guys, uh, you know, everyone committed that year that uh, we were willing to win it and uh, that we wanted to do it not only for ourselves but for Coach Smith. Uh, you know, it's time to win another one. Everyone was talking about it. it's been 12 years. When is Coach Smith is going to win another one? And uh, I was, you know, I was very thankful that I was a part of it. Things were a bit shaky early. Talented Michigan raced out to a 23-13 lead and looked as if they might just be too good for the Tar Heels. But then Donald Williams sparked a 12-2 run that tied the game. Carolina led by six at halftime, and in the second half, it was more Donald. Donald spots up for a three. Got it. Carolina back in front on Williams' fourth three-pointer of the night in five attempts. It feels great, obviously, but um, now I don't really know how to add. I, it was just hit me tomorrow, but, you know, I, I couldn't have did it by myself. I think I have a great team, and, and they did a great job out there tonight, so I can't take all the credit. I have a great team. The game will be remembered not only for Donald Williams' marksmanship, but also for a Michigan blunder. Senior George Lynch. Before we played the national championship game, uh, it was early in the year. Uh, we were practicing, and, and Donald Williams called a timeout. And, you know, Coach Smith almost blew up that, uh, you know, someone else used his timeout. And, and you know, to look back on it, you know, that, that won a national championship. And before. Weber, front court, Carolina thought he'd travel with it. Weber, front court, Carolina with foul. He takes a timeout. They're out foul. of timeout. Technical foul. Technical foul on Michigan. They're out of timeouts. Tar Heel teams aren't immune from mistakes, but Coach Smith makes sure that most of the errors occur in private at practice. Senior forward, Pat Sullivan. A, a, a feeling that we know that we work probably harder than that other team, so it wasn't a conceited thing. We were just very confident in our abilities and our, and our coach because we were so prepared. Donald Williams' free throw is good. 76 to 71. And the party is ready to begin on Franklin Street. Big Eric Montross and his teammates have done it. The final score, 77-71. Winning the national championship against Michigan is a, a dream come true, and uh, every time I see the ring on my finger, I remember that. Game. Over Carolina. The Tar Heels have won the national championship right where they won it 11 years ago. We set out every year to win the national championship, and I'm pleased that we've been a national contender every year for a number of years. And uh, it is exciting to walk out there and say, hey, it's over. We won it. And now it's my pleasure to present the National Championship Trophy to Coach Smith and the University of North Carolina. Congratulations. Thank you very much. The feeling that, that we all had for each other, I mean, that love and that, that feeling of family that all the guys felt and, and just, just the way we made that run down the stretch and to win the whole National Championship was just something I'll never forget. Next, the coaching fraternity as 877 continues after this local break. Hi, this is... 877, presented by Furniture Land South, continues. Because of his relationship with his former players, coaches, and managers, it's been said that Dean Smith has over 200 children. Often a member of the Carolina basketball family will decide to go into coaching, and having learned from the master, it's not surprising when they succeed. Former point guard and current assistant, Phil Ford. Now, I consider coaching harder than playing. Uh, he has a special relationship, uh, and, and he's very smart. Uh, I think sometimes you kind of take for granted that he has the ability to uh, take what he has and to blend it uh, to his philosophy uh, offensively and defensively. It's just an amazing that anyone can do from year in and year out. Gamecock head coach Eddie Fogler spent 15 years as a Dean Smith assistant. He's incredibly fair from year to year. He knows how to communicate with people. I've never been around anybody who can get people to respond out of respect, not out of fear. Middle Tennessee head coach Randy Wheel has seen it as a player and as an assistant for Coach Smith. Nobody gets preferential treatment. No one 
is immune to the rules. Not only like the superstars on the team, but also like the 15th man on the team and have all of them on the same page. And, uh, you know, uh, I think Coach Smith is one of the best teachers that I've been around. You know, I'm sure there's a bunch of them, but the one that I've learned the most from is, is Coach Smith. Players aren't just players for Coach Smith. They are truly student athletes. Seattle Supersonic head coach George Carl. I don't know if any program in, in the history has ever done the student athlete process as well as Coach Smith and, and his staff. And, not only does he produce very good basketball players, he produces a great deal of uh, excellent citizens and leaders and in many, many fields. Buzz Peterson is head coach at Appalachian State University. For all these years he's been doing it, it's just, uh, it's unbelievable. It's mind-boggling, really, that every year that you, you know, that he keeps himself going and they, they're drilling, flowing, and, you know, but you, you got to have some good people with you also. Roy Williams was a 10-year assistant at Carolina before taking over at Kansas. He says he's the common denominator, and that's the reason it's okay to name the building after him. What's going to happen is every player and every former coach is going to feel like they're part of this one, too, and I think that's a great thing for Coach Smith. Some of the greatest appreciation for this record comes from the men who compete against Coach Smith most fiercely, like Duke's Mike Krzyzewski. Two programs that have stood the test of time. Of course, in Dean's case, he stood the test of time twice as long as I have, and uh, I respect that immensely to have somebody who's that competitive and has had that standard of excellence in, in how his teams have played for that long. Uh, it's, a, it's an uncommon, unmatched record. Wake Forest, Dave Odom. It's a, it's a record that belongs to the Atlantic Coast Conference and particularly the state of North Carolina. State the state. I mean, this state is a basketball state. And that record ought to be resting in this state somewhere. If it's down in Chapel Hill, that's great. Uh, that's where it should be because uh, Dean Smith, uh, in my way of thinking, is the finest coach, the best coach to ever coach the college game, and he should have the record. And Maryland's Gary Williams, who has both played and coached against Dean Smith's teams. The most incredible thing to me is I, I remember my junior year, Dean Smith changing from a 2-3 zone to run and jump, and I've seen him play that way. Then I've seen him get the big teams where he plays a lot of zone again. And I've seen him do things um, with the three-point line when it first came in that was really original that other guys weren't doing. And to me, that's been the reason he's stayed in it this long, plus won so many games every year, is because he's always been on the cutting edge of innovation. But as good a basketball coach as Dean Smith is, he may be an even better person. Indiana's Bob Knight is one of his closest friends in coaching. For him to be able to stay at one institution, uh, free of violations, uh, have the kind of record that he's had, the percentage of games that they've won, the championships that they've won uh, over all of those years, and the total number of games that they've won, I think, is a great, great accomplishment, indicative uh, of a guy that, that, number one, really knows how to coach, uh, and number two, uh, has decided from day one that, uh, that things are going to be done the absolute uh, right way. I think it's a tremendous accomplishment. Venture through a long, narrow drive, crowded with vines, laden with grapes, and discover... 877, presented by Furniture Land South, continues. Dean Smith's career has linked both the University of North Carolina and the state of North Carolina with basketball excellence. But his legacy transcends basketball. Just the mention of his name conjures up images of grace under fire, winning with class, and accepting defeat with dignity. Images of doing things right advancing the cause of civil rights, and treating everyone with respect. Former UNC Chancellor Chris Fordham is proud to have Coach Smith as such a visible and effective university ambassador. He's good to his players, for example. He would never abuse or curse a player, or never in, in, never in any way uh, embarrass them publicly. He believes in them, and he supports them throughout their careers. And that's real, and that's not all that common among competitive athletic coaches. Carolina Athletic Director John Swafford says that Dean Smith epitomizes what a coach should be. I think Dean, first and foremost, considers himself a teacher, uh, not just of the game of basketball, but uh, of life. And, and I think that he sees that very much as, as his mission as a college basketball coach. And without getting his priorities out of order. Reverend Bob Seymour. One of the things that Dean has said repeatedly, and it's sometimes difficult for, for those who are in basketball enthusiasts to accept at face value, is remember, it's just a game. I do think that Dean knows that it's just a game. I think he sees more important things in life, 
and I respect him for that. Another great friend of Carolina basketball is Lillian Lee. When young people know that you are honest and sincere and you care about them, they listen to what you say. They know that he really cares about them, first of all, as an individual who happens to be a good basketball player. Coach Smith values his privacy, but those who know him best are players, each of whom is in his inner circle. Men like James Worthy. He really uh, teaches you to be a man and uh, teaches you to, to make the right decisions, you know, make your own decisions, I think. And uh, I think, uh, you know, he's probably played a big part in me becoming uh, a man as far as making decisions and being able to handle uh, myself in, in all kinds of situations. Al Wood. I don't think he will, will ever realize and never know just how much the players love him and how much the players respect him, uh, more so as a person than a coach. Bobby Jones. Just the encouragement that he was, the way that he helped me to become the, the athlete that I later on became because I would not have been a, an NBA caliber player, I'm convinced, if I had not come to this school and uh, worked with Coach Smith. Brad Doherty. Words are kind of tough to put into place to describe Coach Smith. His basketball philosophies have been tremendous over the years, but more than that, uh, I think of Coach Smith as being a tremendous humanitarian. Pete Budko. Players come and go, and the only thing that's been consistent about his record at Carolina has been Dean Smith. He's the one who's got it. He's the one who's defined the way that he wants Carolina to be, and, and he's the one who's made it successful. Jim Delaney. Interested and concerned about school what you were doing after school. Uh, we were young people. So we made mistakes sometimes, but he was always there. Bill Ford. Well, if you're lucky, you know, you can count the number of true friends you have on one hand, and, and I'm very fortunate to uh, call Dean Smith one of my true friends. George Lynch. You think you, uh, you, you've seen it all, and in the following year, you know, he shows you something new. Jeff Denny. He has the same class, same integrity. Uh, same honesty. Mitch Kupchak. When someone asks me, you know, where I went to college, and I say North Carolina, they all look at me and say, wow, you know, did, did you play for Coach Smith? And of course I can say yes. So I think that's my memory, really. You know, a tremendous source of pride. Larry Miller. Absolutely one of the most phenomenal people I've ever met in my lifetime. Sam Perkins. I've truly been in his debt forever because of the fact that he's he's been one of those inspirational people in my life. Walter Davis. From playing in the NBA and being around a lot of other players, no one else has a program like Dean Smith's program. Warren Martin. He's a father to all of us because he, talk, he talks to us, he tells us what, he gives us a real understanding of the game of basketball and through that, the game of life. And Michael Jordan. That just makes me feel proud that, you know, the family of North Carolina is so big and I'm just happy I'm a part of it. As for Dean Smith himself, he wants others to have the credit. It had never been a goal of mine. It wasn't a goal for at any point. I'm not that that type of goal oriented. My goal is for us to what do we win now? 26 games so we, or 25. We'd like to win 27. That's my goal. With his creative retentive, analytical mind, organizational skills, and attention to detail, Dean Smith could have chosen any career path and been successful. But in what other field would he have touched so many lives? How else could he have instilled so much confidence in so many young men, galvanized legions of fans, and helped shape the identity of this university and of our state? Luckily, he chose to become a teacher, an educator, a basketball coach. How many more wins will there be? How many more dramatic comebacks? How many more championships? Nobody knows, of course. And so this is a story that's ending cannot yet be written. And in a way, how it ends doesn't matter. Because Dean Smith's place in history is already secure as the best college basketball coach who ever lived. A tribute to college basketball's all-time winningest coach was produced and written by Larry Stone and Nick Mixon. Production assistance provided by Woody Durham. Special thanks to Andrea Hill.
Bob Ellis, Kevin Wolf, and Joe Tatro. Today's presentation of 877, a tribute to college basketball's winningest coach. Brought to you by Furniture Land South of High Point, the world's largest home furnishing show place. Warner Books, publishers of the Dean's List, Subway, the way a sandwich should be, and by the Herald Sun. Commemorating this memorable milestone with its Dean Smith Special Souvenir Edition and poster. 877, a special presentation of Tar Heel Sports Marketing. Copyright 1997.